we saw in our exploratory discussion that being able to convert from qualitative variables down into a discrete random variable is really nice because it'll make it so that we can find these probabilities very efficiently, but it only works under very particular conditions. And the condition we're going to learn about is called the binomial random variable condition. And it's quite complicated. There's a lot to it. So let's look at it. So we're not only going to be able to use that special formula that finds those probabilities if these four conditions are met. So an experiment is said to be a binomial experiment if, number one, the random probability experiment is performed a fixed number of times n. So each repetition of the experiment is called a trial. So you have to say we're going to do three trials, three tosses of the NBA, or three tosses of the, the basketball for the NBA players. That's it. You're not going to keep going. You're not going to have 20 two people and then have them keep trying and trying and trying. Although if you set it at 22 and gave them a fixed number of tries, that's okay. But it has to be fixed. The trials should be independent. So one toss should have no effect on the next toss, for example. For each trial, there should be two disjoint outcomes, success and failure. Right? You can't have a third option. That won't work. The probability of success is the same for each trial of the experiment. So little p is the probability of success. And some books call it q, so p and q, mind you, p's and q's. q is 1 minus p, and it's the probability of failure. Now notice they have to add up to 1 because they're complements of each other. Okay, And then x is the number of successes in n trials. Right? That's what x stands for, so I should, I should maybe underline that. Okay. So that's an important idea. And that means that it can go as low as zero because you could have no successes all the way up to n, whatever n was. So if you have a fixed number of trials n, right, that would mean that you have at most n successes. And this is a really important concept. That's why we cover this section for a variety of reasons. But one of them is because this is going to be how proportions are going to work for us in later chapters. Now, why proportions? Well, if you do polling and surveying and you ask people a question, they'll usually say, yes, I agree with that, or no, I don't agree with that, or something to that effect. Or let's say um, you're interested in a particular political candidate. All you want to know is, are they going to vote for that candidate? That's success. And then if there's 20 other opponents, then if they're going to vote for any of their opponents, you call that failure. You don't even care which opponent it is. And you can convert um, raw data, qualitative data, like who you're going to vote for, whether you're going to give candy away at Halloween, yes or no. You're going to take yes, no questions or who you're going to vote for questions, qualitative questions, and you'll be able to break them down into a success and failure and be able to apply this binomial probability distribution. So that's going to be very important to us later on. All right, so let's use the NBA example one more time, one last time. Actually, it's not the last time. Um, and let's see if we can apply these criteria and figure out whether they're true. So the first thing we need to do, is when you do this, you actually have to write out what each of the criteria were. So the first one is, was it performed a fixed number of trials? And the answer to that is, yes, absolutely it was. It was a fixed number of trials, so you say yes. So you write out what it was, what the criteria is, and you say yes. And the experiment was performed n equals three times. Okay. The next one, were the trials independent of each other? Well, yes, because each player doesn't have any effect on the next player's throw, right? So whether one player succeeds has no bearing on the next player. And I'll give you a little hint about NBA players. Um, actually, it didn't have to be three separate players. In general, they've tracked it. Um, most NBA players, all NBA players pretty much, are independent from one throw to the next. And that's because they just have their percentage. You know, that NBA player shoots at 80%, then that player is going to shoot at 80%. And it doesn't really change that much depending on the situation. So all the fans screaming behind the base or behind the boards don't really have that much effect on an NBA player because they're professionals. They perform tens of thousands of those shots in their career between practice and playing. All right, now are there two disjoint outcomes? Well, absolutely there are. Um, there's making the shot and missing the shot, right? Pretty easy with a, something like this. So we're converting making the shot, missing the shot, that action that um, you can envision the ball going through the hoop, that's becoming a number for us, right? We're going to call it success and fail. Speaking of which, let's actually convert it into a number. 
So the, the success is making the shot. The failure is missing the shot. So those are the words. That's the qualitative part of this. And we want to convert it into the quantitative part. So I'm going to do that right here. X is the number of successes. Sorry about that. X is the number of successes, the number of successful three foes, right? And that means it goes zero, one, two, up to three. You can't have any more than three because you're only having three shots. So this is quantitative. You're taking something that's qualitative, success and fail, and you're going to convert it into something that's quantitative, which would be zero, one, two, three, right? And that's extremely powerful, right? So the qualitative success fail, great. And then you convert it to the quantitative number. How many successes there will there be? And you could have as low as zero, always at zero, right? All the way up to whatever N is. And N for us was three. All right, now the last part, will the probability of success be the same for every trial? Sure, absolutely, right? The probability of success is 0.77. And that's consistent for each player going up to the line as it's the overall NBA average. So it's just gonna be 0.77 for each of these players. And that also, by the way, means that the probability of failure is 0.23. Now we were asked in this problem to find N, P, X, and Q. So let me just underline those here. Here's N right here. Here's P, we just found that. Here's Q, right, which is one minus P. And then X is actually all of this. It's quite large for X because it's both the words, the number of successful throws, and then it's the numbers, zero, one, two, and three. All right, you have to do that, believe it or not, for every problem that's like this, unless you're told ahead of time that it's binomial. But when you're asked to explain how this experiment is binomial, and how the criteria is satisfied, you have to write all this down, which means it would be very wise of you to put this entire box essentially right in your note sheet for the exam or exams, right? Because you're going to have to explain, you have to write down each one and explain them all.